Hello BookTube, this is Weekly Reads. My reading week has been split between a disappointing weekend and a glorious reading work week. So, my plan for this past weekend was to read The Last Kings of Macedonia and the Triumph of Rome by Ian Worthington. Uh, this is a history of the last two kings of Macedonia, Philip V and Perseus, and how and their relations with Rome that eventually led to conflict and war and the eventual dissolution of the Macedonian monarchy under Roman um, pressure and conquest, and the eventual carving up of Macedonia into uh, Roman provinces. So the reason for this book is that um, Philip V and Perseus haven't had histories written about them or biographies written about them in the better part of a century. And so both are well overdue. Both also need, um, or Worthington argues that particularly Philip V, deserves rehabilitation, that the narratives written about him are wrong, that Philip V was not a megalomaniacal, would-be world conqueror, that he was just trying to protect his kingdom the best way he could, um, and ultimately it didn't work out for him. Which seems to be the story of most of the um, monarchs who uh, whose kingdoms fell to Rome. Um, so the introduction is largely um, an argument for Philip V and Perseus. And then the first two chapters are an overview of Macedonia and a history of Macedonia from Philip II to Philip V. So for most of Macedonia's history, Macedonia was effectively a Greek backwater. Um, it was on the north side of Mount Olympus, and it and Macedonia did not develop in the same way as the southern Greek city-states did. Um, Philip II uh, changed that his reforms of the Macedonian army and uh, resource extract exploitation led to Macedonia being able to impose its will on its neighbors and effectively conquer the southern Greek city-states, and under Alexander the Great, um, conquering most of the known world. However, of course, with Alexander's death, um, the Macedonian Empire broke up under 40 years of war between Alexander's surviving generals and their heirs, and eventually led to um, three large kingdoms sort of forming. Um, under the main one here would be the Macedonian kingdom under the Antigonids, who were descended from a general of Alexander's. Um, once Alexander's heirs were killed off in the wars of the successors, However, the Antigonids, like their Macedonia, largely began to fade as a power, particularly compared to the other two major kingdoms. So that's where things stood for Philip V when he came to the throne. Um, so from there, the book looks at the various conflicts that Philip V was involved in and then later Perseus. Um, I did bail around the 70 pages in. Um, in part because when you have that sort of introductory material, the overview of the country and then a quick history of it in a few chapters, particularly in such a thin book, it's like, do you really have the material? Or you're padding. And the um, once to focus shifts to Philip, the narrative is just weird. Uh, one of the chapters starts with the social war, which was basically a, a Greek civil war, 
as much as the Greeks could have a civil war at this time. And the war doesn't end with that chapter. It leads into the next chapter, which is more of a focus on the First Macedonian War, which would have been with Macedonian Rome. And then that war bleeds into the next chapter. It's just, it's just, it didn't work. And I just really did not enjoy this book. So I build on it. Now, my idea after I bailed on The Last Kings of Macedonia was to read The Stone Diaries by Carol Shields, get a good chunk of it read on Saturday, and then read it some more on Sunday. That did not happen because me and my mom went over to my brother's um, for a visit, which turned out about as well as could be expected. And so I didn't read anything else on Saturday, and I started reading um, my reading weekend on um, Sunday, and I decided to read uh, or reread The Dream of the Unified Field, Selected Poems, 1974 to 1994 by Jory Graham. Um, this collection is one of those books that I had... Uh, when I was in college, in my early 20s, and got rid of, once I got out of um, classics, canonical, modern, and contemporary fiction, poetry, and drama. But there's always been a nagging desire to have it back. And a few years ago, I reacquired it. Um, and I've read it a few times since. And I have a very mixed reaction to Jory Graham's work. There are times when I quite like it, and there are times when it doesn't quite work for me. And this reading was one of those later experiences. Um, the collection didn't quite work on me as well as it has in the past, although there were some really good poems in here. Um, and I was thinking of if I'd done... Uh, Poetry Thursday yesterday, I would have read one of the poems from this collection, but I didn't. So, anyway. So, the bulk of my reading over the past oh, reading week has been finishing up Alice in Borderland by Hero Asso. I read the final four volumes. Volume six. Volume 7. Sorry, Dada, I'm covering your face up. Uh, volume 8. And Volume 9. So, to recap. Alice in Borderland is a series about a young man named Arus Rihoi, um, who has a crappy life. His father is emotionally abusive. His He has a distant relationship with his younger brother, who is the favorite child of the family. And Aris has... Um, uh, basically, he's he doesn't have much of a future. Um, and so he spends his time hanging out with um, his uh, friends, uh, Karube and Chota. Um, Chota is much like him, while Karube is a bit more proactive. He, he has a bit more of a future. He actually owns his own bar, despite only being 18. Um, so one day, the three are walking to, I think, Shinjuku. Um when they come across a fireworks display and this fireworks display intensifies and the next thing they know they wake up at Kurobe's bar and it looks like years have passed the dust has accumulated the food's expired and so the trio go and explore and what they find is a seemingly abandoned Tokyo however as the evening comes on um, they find a shrine that is lighted, that is sort of set up for a festival. And so the trio go in and eat and sort of 
think they're about to experience a festival when they meet a young woman named Shibuki. And Shibuki informs them that, no, this is not a festival that you've just entered into a game, uh, the Three of Clubs. And so basically they are trapped in this venue and they have to play the game. When they survive the game, when they clear the game, they are given thesis um, with uh, three days left. And from there, um, Aris has endures uh, tragedy and struggle and camaraderie and love as he tries to survive and understand what Borderland is. So how Borderland works is that uh, is on immigration cycles. So every immigration cycle, uh, people from the real world are transported to this abandoned Tokyo. Most of these people, and their arrivals are staggered, are players. They basically wander around without any clue what's going on, stumble upon one of these lighted game venues, and have to play. If they survive the game, if they clear it, they're given a visa for however long the uh, game's difficulty was. So a three of clubs gives you three days extension on your visa, an ace probably one day, ten, ten days. Um, if you fail to clear the game, you're dead. Um, you get a game over and you are killed. Um, a smaller group of these immigrants are selected as dealers. They monitor the games, they set them up, they clean up after the end of the games, and their visas are extended by the number of players who are killed in those games. So even though you might be managing a two of hearts game, if three players die in that game, your visa is extended by three days rather than two, as whoever cleared um, the two of hearts would get. <sighs> so uh, Borderland is composed of two stages. The first stage is um, the ace through ten of the four suites, so 40 games. When those, if the players clear those 40 games, they win the first stage and the dealers are killed. If the players all die before clearing the all 40 games, the dealers win and advance to the second stage. Now, the thing about the visas is if they expire, you they are um, the immigrant is deported, and deportation is achieved by a laser through the head. This extends to both players and dealers, as well as if the players win the first, uh, the first stage, then the dealers are executed via laser to the head. So then the second stage begins, where the players, or the surviving faction, player or dealer, have to face 12 car the 12 face card games, the jacks, queens, and kings of the four suites. And these face cards are represented by citizens of Borderland who are revealed to be survivors of a previous immigration cycle who elected to remain in Borderland. Uh, so these four volumes um, take place during the second stage. And it's amazing. I had a blast. So the uh, sixth volume opens with the continuation of the King of Clubs game. So Aris, his um, love interest Usachi, and their friends Kawina and Tata, and the psychopathic Niragi are a team that basically to play the uh, King of Clubs game, you have to have a team of five. 
because the king of clubs leads a team of five. So the game venue is at the harbor, and uh, the shipping crates have been arranged as a maze. And so this game is a bit of a treasure hunt and hide and seek and capture the flag. So within some of the shipping containers are hidden items that give points. Well, so each team starts with an equal number of points. Points can be added to that total via finding those hidden items within the shipping containers. Points can further be won or detected through battles. So at the start of the game, the players are kind of the points that each team has is divided between the players. And those players can then meet a member of the opposing team and have a battle. And the battle is decided between which player has the most points. 500 points is deducted from the loser to the winner's team. However, if a player has only 500 points, and so they go below that number, a laser beam to the head. Um, whoever's really in charge of Borderland really likes lasers to the fore to the head. <laughs> but anyway, um, and then there's also uh, the base, where while a player is touching the base or their own base, they have infinite points. However, if um, the opposing team's members can touch the, that base, they get a tremendous point boost. Not infinite, but it's a significant amount. So initially, Otis's team seems to be winning. They m make some good progress. However, uh, team, team, team King of Clubs sort of makes a comeback. And eventually, it works out to where even with finding the last hidden item, uh, team uh, Addis or team player um, are basically down 500 points. So many of them given to despair because they're going to lose as the uh, time is running out. Uh, Naragi does what Naragi does and assaults Yusaji and Addis beats the tar out of him. And Tata comes up with a means of winning. And it is brutal and it is sad and just heartrending. And the final sort of conversation between Addis and Kiyuma, the king of clubs, is it's really good. Oh, me. that so after team king of clubs is defeated Addis decides to take a break from the games to not compete anymore and the next arc is a brief one uh, that deals with um, Addis and um, oh yeah, that is marvelous. Um, what Addis and Usagi have been up to, and it's pretty cute. Um, and it deals with their burgeoning relationship and deepening relationship, and it is. Interesting. Um, and then the arc ends, or this ends, with the beginning of the Jack of Hearts arc. Now, this arc does not include any of the regular players and is um, solitary confinement. So, uh, 20 players play the game. Um yeah, that is nice too. Um, including the Jack of Diamonds. 
I mean, Jack of Hearts. And it's basically a mystery of them trying to figure out who the Jack of Hearts is. And since it's a um, bit of a mystery, no regular players are featured. Although in the um, uh, adaptation, uh, one of the main characters does participate. But so the idea of the Jack of Hearts game is to basically each, so it takes place in a prison and each player has an explosive collar, which the citizens of Orlando are also fond of, um, with a mechanism at the back that um, randomly shows the four suites, one of the four suites. And each player has to have a kind of basically fight guess. So each round takes is takes place over the course of 60 minutes. The final five minutes of which involves the players being imprisoned in a solitary in solitary confinement and announcing what the suite is at the on the back of their collar. If they guess correctly, they pass on they move on to the next round. If not, it's a game over and the collar explodes. So it's a player win if the Jack of Hearts dies. And the Jack of Hearts wins if all players are killed. Um, even if at the there's the final two. Obviously, one of those final two has to be the Jack and the other player gets the explosive collar. So initially the first the players sort of work together um, and there's enough food to last a long time for this to go on. However, the players begin to turn on each other and give each other the wrong um, sweets, sometimes for petty reasons. And gradually the players are whittled down to a very small number until eventually the Jack of Hearts believes that they've won. Unfortunately for the Jack, um, there were players who kind of figured out who he, who the Jack was and that they had a reason to keep that Jack alive and that the Jack, while being a psychotic, psychotic piece of poo, was not necessarily the worst person playing this game. <laughs> oh, yeah. So this is a dream... Oh, no, I don't want to show that. Oh. So, there is... One thing I love about Asso's work is like the backgrounds. The cityscapes are wonderful. And there's all of the players in, or some of the players in the Jack of Hearts game. So with the Jack of Hearts game ending, um, the story moves to the King of Spades, which is largely told in these two volumes. Uh, so in the, the U.S. release of Alice in Borderland is, so in the original Japanese release, uh, the series was released in 18 volumes, um, and then later bound up in nine two-volume omnibus editions. 
which is how the U.S. release is done in these two-volume omnibus editions. So the first part of this, um, these two volumes features the conclusion of the, the final three chapters of the Jack of Diamonds arc. The other chapters in that volume and then the entirety of the other volume in this uh, features the King of Spades arc. So, um, while the most of the, so the face card games are shown or like the venues are kind of flagged by blimps floating above the game venue with the face card hanging down. Um, all except for the King of Spades. His game venue is the entirety of Tokyo. If the King of Spades finds you, he will shoot you. Or kill you in some other way. That's basically all he does. And the only way for you to clear his game is to kill him. And the arc starts with a group of players coming together. And they have some aspirations of military training. Um, and thinking, banding together, they can defeat the King of Spades. Does not quite work out for them. However, one of these players, um, although he's not one of the active combatants, um, Dodo Hayato, um, is or is the protagonist of an earlier story arc called the Four of Hearts, um, and he flees the King of Spades' assault and goes into the forest. There he runs into a goonie who was in many ways the main antagonist of the witch hunt arc. He was uh, an executive of the beach, the um, a colony of players who came together to try to bring some community, a bit of civilization to this insane, psychotic place. Um, a goonie feeling remorse and shame of what happened during the witch hunt arc or the ten of hearts arc has basically set about engineering a confrontation between himself and the king of spades so that he will die in the encounter however the arrival of dodo um upsets those plans and aguni takes dodo under his wing and tries to teach him in the few days that they have to how to fight, how to sort of defeat the King of Spades. And the King of Spades attacks. And Aguni and Dodo have a good showing. Um, they don't really hurt the King so much, but they manage to survive and to escape. Dodo ends up being ensnared in a trap set by Heia, um, Heia Kane, who was the main protagonist of the Seven of Spades arc, um, which concluded the fifth volume of Alice in Borderland. And Hei and Dodo sort of begin to bond in the King of Spades attacks. And Dodo has a brilliant insight of how exactly is the King of Spades tracking everybody and realizes how he's doing it and Heia takes that advantage away from the King of Spades. And then they flee into a river, because at this point, there is a typhoon hitting Tokyo. So, Dodo and Heia uh, meet back up with Aguni, and they sort of form in the few hours um, before the King of Spades finds them again. A bit of a family, because the three of them are broken. They both have unfortunate relationships or very poor relationships with their parents. Um, Oguni's father was an alcoholic. He and his mother abandoned the family. Um, and Oguni's father was also abusive. Um, Heia's father abandoned the family and the mother's promiscuous and neglectful. And Dodo's father also abandoned the family, and his mother 
developed a gambling addiction and she's been hospitalized and Dodo's been uh, in the care of his grandmother. So all of so these three broken people um, and then they form a bit of a family and that bond is strengthened in trying to survive and ultimately defeat the King of Spades and it is brilliant. It is just wonderful. So I do not want to spoil who the King of Jack of Hearts is, so we'll avoid that. Although that is really good. Oh yeah. So there's the King of Spades. And so the reason, oh yeah, I'll, I'll get to that in a bit. Ooh, I'm hoping I'm not ripping my book up. That would be annoying. Oh yeah, I love that cover. So I need to kind of, oh, this is good too. Oh yeah, man. So yeah, it was wonderful. Okay. So once this arc ends, um, the narrative goes back a few days. Um, and so for the volumes in volume eight, um, it starts with um, a to a short arc called Record of Borderland, where a player who was a reporter um, is basically documenting what's going on and trying to figure out the truth of Borderland. And he meets up with a former beach executive named Mihiru, who's been traveling around, and they discover one of the dealers' um, bunkers and a young woman who claims to have experienced how they're transported to Borderland. However, the King of Spades attacks. So this is before um, the King of Spades arc. The rest of the um, volumes and or the chapters in these two volumes are the King of Diamonds, which features um, Chishia, who is a recurring character who's mysterious, intelligent, ruthless, and sociopathic. Uh, so that so the King of Diamonds begins with the Jack of Diamonds, which is a game of mahjong. And Chishia defeats the Jack of Diamonds and then proceeds directly to challenge the King of Diamonds, which is a former member of the beach named Kazuryu, who's the guy on the cover here. Um, so the King of Diamonds uh, game is a beauty contest, which needs four players plus the King of Diamonds to make five. So the idea of the which it takes place in the Supreme Court building in Tokyo. So the idea of the King of Diamonds is that each player must choose an integer between zero and one hundred. The average of the player's choices 
are then averaged, or basically they're averaged, and then multiplied by 0.8. The resulting number, um, the player who's chosen number is closest to that resulting number wins. And the losing players um, lose a point. With each lost point, a certain amount of Regis Aqua, a sort of an acid, is poured into scales um, set above the players' heads, and the players are uh, confined to their chairs. If the player reaches negative 10 points, the um, acid in the scale overwhelms the counterbalance and the acid drops on the losing player and they get a game over via bath of acid. Oh, sorry. Sorry about this, but I am 36 minutes in, so I am not going to stop for anything. So the players are killed by a bath of acid. With each player elimination, new rules are added. So the um, so basically the game seems to proceed until they reach a stalemate of everybody choosing zero. However, uh, Chishia and one of the other players, Hinako, um, decide to throw monkey wrench in things, and that allows them to um, win a few rounds. However, the other two players playing the game end up reaching negative 10 and get the acid bath. And the two new rules are added. One which is if uh, the players choose the same number, they all lose a point. The, their choices are invalidated and they lose a point. And if a player hits the number exactly, uh, the losing players lose two points. So at this point, Chishia and Kozuryu, the King of Diamonds, begin a conversation where Chishia is trying to ferret out information about Borderland and also rile up the King of Diamonds. Because very much how Chishia wins this arc is by manipulating the King of Diamonds. Although you could also suspect that the King of Diamonds had this planned out initially. Or I wouldn't be surprised if that's a valid argument uh, for why the King of Diamonds set this game up the way he did. So Hinako is eliminated next um, because Chishia guessed the correct answer um, of what the sort of resulting number would be. So she's eliminated, which leaves um, Chishia with negative nine and um, Kazuria with negative eight or seven. And so the final rule is if you choose a hundred, you win. If you choose zero, you lose. And so Chishia basically presses 100 and 100 and 100. And basically, with the dis uh, distribution of points initially at that point, all Kazuri would have to do is press 100 as well and he would win. But he doesn't. For the next rounds until he gets negative zero, negative 10. He chooses zero. He purposely chooses to allow um, Chishia to live. And it's it's weird because in a way this arc is about two extreme contrasts. Kazuryu, despite being a citizen of Borderland, despite being a cog in this psychotic, these psychotic death games, wishes for 
a fair world. Um, that he is super empath empathic. Whereas Shishi is sociopathic. He really cares about nothing but himself. And in a way, Kozuryu's sacrifice in this arc leads to a change in Chishia. Um As winning King of Clubs and his sojourn with um, Usagi begins to change Addis. And so the next arc begins in the final chapters of the, these volumes, which is called Seven Days from the Start, which is so the week. Um, so the second stage lasts a week. So before that, there's a chapter dealing with the big four. Um, Hyuma, the king of spades, whose name is Shirabi, um, Kuzuryu, and Mira. So when they were players in the previous immigration cycle, uh, they would meet up every morning after the games, and they would socialize, and gradually they became friends. And in a way, while the Jack of Hearts is absolutely a psychopath, and two, at least, of the succeeding citizens are psychopaths, these four really aren't. Um, Kiyuma is adrenaline is an adrenaline junkie above anything else. Shirabi is really his murder spree is an attempt to alleviate the suffering of the surviving players because that's what Borderlands is. And uh, Kazuryu is trying to figure out the value of life, and Mira is just childless childishly curious and wanting to understand what Borderland in playing these games can teach her about the human psyche, which is further explored in the Queen of Hearts arc. But it's just, it is a wonderful little sojourn chapter. So with the um, seven days from the start arc, um, the, so this arc begins with uh, Kuina clearing the Jack of Spades and Mahiru clearing the Queen of Clubs. So um, these two games, as well as Jack of Clubs, Queen of Diamonds, Queen of Spades, and King of Hearts are cleared without any um, sort of, of what those games were. There's a montage in the Netflix adaptation that features some of it, but not a whole lot. Um, anyway, so from there, there's basically just the King of Spades and uh, Queen of Hearts. So the bulk of the arc is about, in these volumes, is um, Addis meeting Cheshia and beginning to have a conversation when Naragi shows up and wants to initiate a bit of a impromptu um, 13th game, Battle Royale, between the three of them. And it is basically a contest of foils, because Aris, Naragi, and Shishia are all very similar. They're all very selfish. And, and gradually during their stay in Borland, some of them begin to try to be better people. I'm not entirely sure about Naragi. So let's look at some of the pictures from here. Oh yeah, so there's that. So 
So there's the venue for King of Diamonds. I need to hurry this up. Oh, no. Do not want to spoil that. And also, we'll go with this. <laughs> there. Ah. And then the... So this is how volume eight concludes. Okay. So volume nine uh, revo resolves that conflict or opens with the resolution of that conflict with um, Usagi uh, appearing. Um, Aris is late and Usagi goes looking for him. Um, Niraki tries to shoot her. Um, Aris shoots Naragi and Chishia takes a bullet for Usagi. So now Naragi and Chishia are grievously wounded and they will bleed out and die if they do not get immediate medical attention. And the only way to do that is to return to the real world. And while this is going on, they learn that with the, the, the King of Spades is defeated and there is only one face card left, the Queen of Hearts. And so Aris and Usagi decide to play one last game, and they take on Mira Kan uh, Kano Mira, the Queen of Hearts. And her game is croquet. You basically have to survive three sets, just play three sets of croquet with her to clear the game. However, if you forfeit, you get a game over. And it sounds simple, but this is Mira. She's not going to make it easy. She puts Addis through the ringer. Oh, does she? But also, I mean, it's an amazing arc. And, I mean, particularly um, Asachi's sort of contribution, her sacrifice to bring Addis out of the darkness. It's brilliant. And just... In a way, you kind of wonder what exactly the Queen of Hearts, what Mero is after. Because in a way, much like with the King of Diamonds, was she intending this game in a way to be like what exactly her intentions were? Because once she realizes she's, she's lost and... Um, like seeing Usagi's sacrifice, it just it's like she basically just plays that final set, and it is just interesting. And then the final chapters are the surviving players uh, returning to the real world if they so choose to, and then sort of what happens to them two years later. And it is it's really good. I just. enjoy it but I particularly like with um, uh, during this confrontation between Aris, Naragi and Chishia that Aris kind of makes a choice to change because 
The reason why these three don't particularly like each other is because they are so similar. They're all varying degrees of toxic. And so there's that. And I want to show the uh, oh yeah, and that because there's like all three of them are incredibly lonely and I think don't want to be, but they don't really know how to not be. And in a way, their sojourn in Borderland kind of helps them in a horrific way. So that's the fall of the King of Spades' blimp. And then the final game venue with the um, some of the players who are contemplating taking on the Queen of Hearts. And then this sort of garden. Hmm. <sighs> and then just, yeah. So yeah, this was really, really, I, I had a blast reading these final four volumes and I really love Alice in Borderland. Um, it is just a wonderful, wonderful series. So yeah, that was a blast to read. Um, so gonna do a quick, Pyramid here. Okay, so I have now gone on for 52 minutes, so I need to wrap this up. Um, so my reading today, I don't know if I'm either going to basically do a try chapter tag of various uh, books that have been nominated for prizes. Um, Recently, the long list for the Women's Prize, excuse me, the Carol Shields Prize, and the Booker International Prize have been announced. So I'm kind of tempted to, like, read some from those long-listed books and talk about which ones might interest me, which ones might not. Um, I might also decide to just... Um, browse one of my cookbooks and uh, so I might either do the tri chapter tag later this evening or a bookshelf a bookshelf essential with one of those cookbooks tomorrow I will be reading um hopefully starting on the stone diaries by Carol Shield and that will be my weekend reading and then for the work week I will start uh, with magic the Labyrinth of magic by Shinobu Otaka so my plan is, is to read all 37 volumes in the first few days of April. Wish me luck. <laughs> so that booktube is a incredibly long weekly reads. Um, so I don't know. Hopefully I'll have another video this evening. But if not, thank you. Have a great rest of your afternoon and have a great weekend. And until I see you next time, thank you and stay safe.